This is the second in a two-part conversation I had with Lisa Marciano, a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia, and Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. We talk specifically about rapid onset gender dysphoria and how that can impact families trying to help their teens through it. We discuss some of the types of therapists parents will run into, either ideological clinicians or clinicians who are nervous to work with dysphoric teens. We also look at gender dysphoria and how conversion therapy bans make it challenging for clinicians to work with this population. We also clarify what the bans mean and what they don't mean, and share some of the ways we can explore gender identity without challenging a teenager or young adult on their perceived sense of gender. We discuss the parental experience of going through this process and how important it is for families to take care of themselves, not just for their own sake, but so they can help their child find the best path forward. Here's that conversation. Well, maybe we can shift into, I mean, we've, we've been touching on this, but let's talk a little bit about the special challenges that, that parents face when they have a rapid onset dysphoric teenager trying to find the appropriate care uh, at this time, it can be really hard. So let's, let's talk about what are some things parents should be thinking about. I mean, one thing that comes to mind is, again, to, to focus on the expansiveness of the individual, making sure to be careful about ideological clinicians, because ideologies uh, reduce things into one kind of uh, cut, cut and paste kind of situation in a way. So ideology reduces, and so we want to avoid clinicians that take a hard ide ideological stance on anything. It doesn't have to be just about gender dysphoria, but I would say this would be true for lots of different presenting problems. Sure. I mean, ideology brings with it certainty, and that can feel really good. Like, this is what you have yeah. to do. And unfortunately, I think we have to be able to tolerate uncertainty and that good therapy always involves a lot of uncertainty. And that's, and, and part of what we're trying to do when we do therapy is cultivate that comfort with and uncertainty. It, in fairness, it's so incredibly hard. If, if you are a parent of, of a child who has, has, you know, maybe ROGD to have the confidence to cultivate uncertainty around this, it feels so counterintuitive and impossible. And so kind of it's, it's, it's like they want certainty. Of course they do. If they're, they're a child and they're scared, please somebody give a certainty. And that therefore makes somebody wide open to whoever turns around and says, I'll, I'll fix it. I'll get this. I'll sort this. That you're, you're going to be so vulnerable to falling into that. And I, I do want to raise up the point because I suppose I, I've had a lot of contact with parents and there is an emphasis on the right psychologist and the right road of treatment. And I do think there isn't enough emphasis on, well, let's look at the gaming, let's look at the internet use, let's look at the lifestyle, let's look at maybe doing some exercises at home that might be to do with going out or connecting or that's being dismissed because it's much easier just to look for the right professional. And I know that's not kind of good news for any parent who's saying, yeah, I can't deal with them, I can't. And yet I would say that is so important. Mm -hmm. Kind of bad news for parents, but I think it's incredibly important. Well, Stella, you're kind of lifting up this question of when does a, a teenager actually need therapy, right? And, you know, it's, I, I've written a bit about this and I tell parents this all the time. The irony is not lost on me that I'm an adolescent therapist telling parents don't put so much trust in adolescent therapists, <laughs> me right? Me too, me too. But, but a lot of times I, I, I think, aside from really, really serious acute distress, most young people are just going through the adolescent process and some um, kind of general well-being 101 things being implemented at home can be very powerful in helping a child to feel better and be more engaged with their life. And, and kind of get along with their developmental tasks. So I really like what you're saying, and I find myself advising families often that, you know, don't jump to therapy just because a teenager has a breakup with their um, boyfriend or girlfriend and they're crying for a day doesn't mean that they are mentally ill. Mm -hmm. 
And even right. worse, they can be a lot more than crying. They can be having tantrums and losing it and still yeah. not yeah. need yeah. regularly and still not need actual therapy. Right. They can have some very bad habits. Right. And, and because then we're path- kind of pathologizing something that's normal or honestly kind of trying to outsource the problem to the therapist instead of maybe doing these parenting things that are really difficult. Um, like, you know, I don't know, implementing kind of sane rules around internet, internet use or whatever, you know, yeah. so there can be kind of too much uh, authority and expectation placed on the shoulders of the therapist. I want to just when we're talking about sort of finding a therapist for, for our GD kids, I want to just um, talk about one thing here. We were talking about um, trying to avoid ideological mm. therapists, but I, I think there's something else that happens as well that I've seen, which is um, some parents manage to find a kind of agnostic therapist for their kid who's going to just explore the kid's views about gender, but maybe the therapist isn't particularly um, aware of the, the ROGD trend or perhaps not really aware of social contagion and the way that social influences can affect a teen. And so the therapist is sitting there and the kid comes in and the therapist is not thinking, um, oh, this is a trans kid, I have to affirm. The therapist is simply saying, I'm going to listen. Mm. But the therapist is unaware of all of the many things, perhaps, that that young person has been reading online or hearing from peers. And the therapist starts to hear these stories about, I always hated dresses, and I you know, can't get out of bed in the morning because my dysphoria is so bad. And without any knowledge of the social context, the therapist is like, wow, I've got an actual unicorn here in my office. This is one of those kids who really is trans. And I've seen this happen so many times. And I think it's, in, you know, the therapist is absolutely doing his or her best job and believes that he or she is doing the right thing. But, you know, it's our job in a way. Well, it is our job. <laughs> Not in a way, mm-hmm. it is our job to <laughs> listen to our clients and empathize with them. And so it can be pretty easy for a therapist to be led to believe what the child is saying as if that's the whole story. And it does remind me of the multiple personality disorder. uh, What do we want to call it? Contagion craze. I'm not sure that happened in the eighties and nineties, because again, you, you maybe didn't think that the person sitting across from you was necessarily going to have multiple personality disorder, but when she started acting out the full range of symptoms and you'd read a little bit, or maybe you'd been to a training, you're like, Oh, there it is. Because you're not holding in mind all of the social influences. I think as a field, Mm -hmm. we have a kind of lacuna about how social influences affect mental health and the um, the sort of performance of certain symptoms. We just are not as aware of that as we should be. So I tell parents when they're looking for a therapist for their ROGD team that they have to actually do better than just finding someone who says that you know he or she is going to be open-minded and follow the child's lead. I think that's a great starting point. But I think that the person also has to show some awareness of how social influences can affect a kid. Yeah, I, I, I did a paper, uh, I wrote, wrote, did some writing around this and I, I interviewed therapists and again and again was said was effectively that therapists felt if, if somebody with gender issues comes in, I, I don't feel I have the knowledge that I would have with anorexia, with suicide, with child sex abuse, with everything else I can take, but with gender, because it seems like such a new, and I didn't get training in it, I will just refer them on. And I I feel there's a huge fear around ordinary, really good, competent, experienced therapists who just think, okay, I can do everything, but I'm not sure I can do gender. And I don't think that's true. I think that's over, over, over said as a, as a, as a fear, because if you read up about it, yes, the jargon is difficult to penetrate. And yes, there are issues and you're dead right, Lisa. But if you do some reading around it, it, the the information is out there. So while I agree with you completely, Lisa, I feel an awful lot of brilliant therapists are being lost 
and people can't access really good therapists because the therapists won't touch gender and they'll touch everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, you both have outlined the, it's like there's like a fork in the road when parents are looking for a clinician and they find exactly one of two things, either what Stella is saying, a clinician who feels completely uh, unprepared to work with this kind of client or the clinician like Lisa, what you're saying, who goes into it with a, a neutral mind, but because they're not aware of the social aspect, they can end up um, kind of identifying exactly with what the client is saying and it prevents them from taking a psychological look. So, you know, Stella, you're, you're talking about, again, the, the breadth of what a therapist should be able to do. A therapist should be able to meet a client where they are and have some sort of curiosity about how the presenting problem or the symptoms are related to all these other aspects of the person's life. And they should spend time getting to know the person as a whole individual. So why, why do you all think that we are at that place where clinicians feel they don't have the confidence to treat a human experience, which is part of what psychologists are supposed to do, unless it's within their very narrow kind of uh, area of expertise? I think a lot of misinformation has gone out. I think I remember somebody saying, and I thought it was really clever, that um, gender dysphoria and the feeling of being born in the wrong body is a very, very good description of a feeling, but it's not a diagnosis. And people feel they're born in the wrong body. And yes, that's what they feel. But that doesn't mean they are born in the wrong body. And I think that has that that is an example of misinformation that people say to me therapists oh i believe people can be born in the wrong body and i'm like mm, i just don't think there's enough writing around this i don't think there's enough really kind of authentic truths truth seeking writing around this that, that good competent therapists could actually say that line when when it to me it it it, it it strikes me that it, it seems in, in, intensely misinformed. You, you, you know, Stella, what you're talking about where we can, someone can say, I feel like I was born in the wrong body, and we as therapists could respond very empathically to that, but not necessarily believe that that is factually true. I mean, that is exactly the space in which a psychological attitude is held. That I can be with you and feel how very important yeah. these distressing feelings are, and I can hold that they might not be literally true. And, you know, it's difficult to hold a psychological perspective. And I don't think that uh, psychology training programs always do a very good do job of teaching that. You know, we mm -hmm. can become very concretized and think in terms of. Um, uh, you know, empirical data, which matters. I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but it's a real skill to hold a psychological attitude. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a, a loss of metaphor, you know, when a kid comes in and says, I think I'm supposed to be a boy. There's so, so much richness there to explore if we can understand it as a metaphor, right? Which yeah. is different from challenging the client. It doesn't require a challenge. It's just a curiosity about, wow, this is a powerful metaphor, a powerful statement. What else does it mean? What, are, what is this client talking about? And I think that gets lost when we are overly concretized um, and overly fixated on diagnostic labels and checklists and what, what those things indicate. So maybe now would be a good time to talk a little bit about conversion therapy bans. Since Stella, you brought up this uh, lack of confidence that a lot of clinicians have in working with dysphoric youth. I wanted to just spend a little bit of time talking about this because there's, like with most things, there's some hyperbole out there around this issue and for some good reasons, but maybe we can just spend some time talking about what are the conversion therapy bans that include gender identity? What do they actually prevent the clinician from doing? Um, I can share my understanding is that 
the clinician should not make any direct attempts to change the individual's gender identity. There is room for exploration. So again, the way I try to understand this is if this statement about being wrong, being in the wrong body is a metaphor, there are so many therapeutic techniques to explore that with a patient that is not going to threaten their sense of identity. So I find there's still plenty of room for psychological work, even when uh, we look at the therapy ban, the conversion therapy ban, including a gender identity. I agree. I think if you do explorative therapy, you cannot really be wrong because explorative therapy is good intrinsically and always. And so long as it's explorative therapy without an agenda, without a goal in mind, you're on safe ground. And I think it's, it's, it's almost a lack of confidence in people. I think it often, from my, in my experience, and also in some research I did suggest to me, the lack of training around gender has left a lot of therapists feeling inexperienced and unqualified to, to treat gender. And yet people who, who decide that they are qualified are either they've been through a gender experience themselves or they've done very short courses because the courses out there, they're not accredited. They're, they're kind of, they're, 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 I'm sure some of them are very, very, very good, but they aren't a specific training. And so when somebody tells me I need to go to a gender specialist, it's like you've imbued some, some kind of importance to that word it is actually a self-identified moniker. And so mm -hmm. it, it's something to be kind of wary around. But sorry, I kind of went off on one there with the conversion therapy. I do think that the, the most important job for a, a therapist who's worried about conversion therapy is to balance the fear of converting a child uh, to not transitioning with the fear of converting their child, the, the, the client, to um, uh, not being gay. And so you have to try, I don't know if I kind of articulated that very well, but you have to kind of trod the middle ground where an awful lot of people who detransition, for example, seem to have come from a place of internalized homophobia. And therefore we have to take that piece of information with us in our, in our work around making sure that we're not carrying out conversion therapy and make sure we're not converting gay people to transitioning or fear of being gay. I'm sorry for being so clunky there. But no, I think you're, I think you, that's a great point. I mean, if you see, let's say an, uh, an adolescent natal female who is identifying as a trans boy and, um, this person is same sex attracted according to natal sex. Um, you know, what, what is your ethical duty there? I mean, I think you kind of have to explore, the sexual attraction. You have to understand how that fits in and how that may be playing into the person's desire to transition to, to you know, being a man. Um, because they're both kinds of conversion therapy, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I do think, Stella, like you said, you can't really go wrong if you just explore. I think that it's important to bring in kind of fact-based um, discussions around biology and as well as what one can expect when one does transition. In my work with detransitioners, I find that there was very little information provided about what some of these interventions might actually look like, like what they what they could achieve and what the side effects might be. And uh, you know what the what it might be like to go through life with a deepened voice or what what might happen to your dating pool. I mean these are things that I think ethically we have to explore the consequences of an action that a client might want to take with the client. That's, that's, you know, when people come in and want to talk about divorce, you know, we talk about all kinds of things like mm -hmm. what is that going to do to your finances? How might it affect your kids? What's it going to do to your family relationships? You know, you want to talk about all those things before you make a major decision. So I think exploring all aspects of what a gender transition might mean and not just the, um, the raw, raw ones, you know, the ways that it might feel good. Um, I just want to say too about the conversion therapy bands, you know, Sasha, I heard you say, and I think this is really important that the way this language is, uh, is worked is there's always room for exploration. So I think therapists that are feeling nervous about it, 
should not feel nervous if you're just mm. exploring in an open-ended way. There's nothing wrong with that. At the same time, I do feel empathy for therapists who are made nervous by it. In my experience, I mean, in the United States, it's different from state to state, and I've read the language in many of the laws. And to me, it looks like what happened in many states is they took a gay conversion therapy ban and they just inserted the words or gender identity. Mm -hmm. So it changes the whole meaning of it, actually. Mm -hmm. And it also is very unclear. It's really, really not clear. Like, what, what, what would that look like? What are we talking about? And it's one of those things in the law where it's vague enough that it probably is acting as a kind of chilling effect on the practitioners because they're worried of, it's so vague that you're worried of running afoul of it. Yes, you know? that's right. And because this is such a new area uh, for psychology and for therapists, there's a lot of trepidation about, you know, sticking your nose in something that you don't know enough about. And there are laws that may be really frightening, uh, the laws banning certain kinds of interventions. So I, I certainly empathize with therapists who feel like they'd rather steer clear. And I, I completely understand that. And that's why, I mean, I, I believe the wording is really, uh, really poor. And I think it does cause a lot of therapists who would otherwise provide ethical, basic psychological care from turning away dysphoric teens. And I think that's a real disservice to these young people. Um, one, one quick thing I just wanted to mention, Lisa, you brought up this great point about uh, exploring with a client what transition will actually look like. And yeah. I think one area that I think is very valuable in my work is exploring the dysphoria itself. Because again, when you have this term it supposedly encapsulates something that everyone is clear on, but it's not. Dysphoria means about a million different things, depending on the, the client, their experiences, their age, their developmental process, what they've been through. So that has been really uh, valuable in my work is really just let's strip all the jargon, right? And let's really talk about what do you mean when you say that? And that's another reason why I think it's important for clinicians not only to be not ideological, but also to have basic psychological training in, in how these things are metaphorical. Because Stella, you talked about therapists feeling like they need to go to all these gender trainings in order to be experts. But the gender trainings based on what I've seen take the idea of identity at face value and there is not a lot of room for understanding it metaphorically. So even if you find someone with decades of gender training, they might be locked into this uh, kind of unidimensional understanding of what dysphoria is. Yeah, yeah very, very medicalized, mm -hmm. medicalized mm -hmm. and literal sense. You know, Sasha, that's a great point. I mean, I know when someone comes in, let's say an adult walks in and says, I'm here because I'm depressed. Mm. The first thing I say is, well, what does that mean? Yeah. Because depressed is another word like dysphoria, like, oh, I, I have yeah. depression. You know, we all think we're depressed. But first of all, there is kind of a, 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 you know, a clinical checklist you can go through. But even more than that, I'm interested in what is that experience like for you? Thank because you. it's deeply, deeply, deeply individual. And it's only when I start to understand the very unique nuances that it has for that individual that we're really in interesting territory where we can begin to develop a different relationship with those feelings. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that the, the kind of the, the shininess of the new can, can turn people's heads very easily. And, you know, when, when Prozac first came out, it, it, it was so excitable and an awful lot of, from what I've read, an awful, it was overprescribed and over kind of inflated as a massive solution. And I, I think gender dysphoria feels very new right now. It feels like it's a it, new field. And it feels sexy. Mm. <laughs> like, you know, it's like the new thing. Yeah. And, and you as a therapist can become a bit inflated with that and feel really yeah. important because you're doing this kind of cutting edge progressive thing. Yeah. Right. Experts here. I can sit up. I know. And in I go. And it, it, it's, it's a very, it's a very, as we spoke about earlier, the power of the therapist, put that with excitement of new diagnosis it feels new even though it isn't all that new 
it, it, it's certainly a new field and it's a very, very kind of new treatments are coming out and certainly affirmative approach is very new. And when I say this to clients, they're like, as if, well, it's the only approach. It's like, no, there's, ma there's many approaches. Mm -hmm. so right now is, is, is very much in vogue, but there are lots of different ways. One thing, uh, two things I want to say was one that I think people who are transitioning need to know that gender dysphoria might not go away. And uh, where will you be if that happens? And we need to explore that because otherwise you're kind of allowing the, 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 the client to think that there might be a solution to something. The second thing it reminds me of the trans woman, Debbie Hayden, and she went for therapy before, she's a trans woman, she went for therapy before she transitioned. And the therapist did something very interesting. I don't think I would do it, um, I, 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 but I, I think it was very good technique. I'm very interested in it. She literally got <laughs> a, a chair against uh, the door and said, imagine that's transitioning. We're going to put a chair in front of that. Now let's explore all your other options so that in the future, if you ever need to think, did I explore all my options? I will know that I explored all my options. What I find really interesting, and they explored them, they explored all the other options. What I find very interesting is Debbie says that any time that she's hard, and we all have dark nights of the soul. Where should I have done this? Where mm. am I? Who am I? What have I done? Is this right? About everything. When she has them, she knows she explored deeply all the other options. And that gives somebody a real sense of themselves and a confidence of being able to go forth freely in life. And well, that's the gift explorative therapy will give you. Right. That's the clarity, yeah. you know? And I mean, again, I've experienced this with people who come in and, and want to know if they should bust up a 30 year marriage, you mm. know, or whatever. And, and you, you work it out and you walk all the way around it and you talk about all the different things and you look at it this way and that way. And I mean, sometimes it takes years yeah. You no. Know? But then it's like, no, this is, you know, either I'm, I'm going to stay or no, I got to do it. But it's exactly what you're talking about, Stella, that when you wake up in a cold sweat at three o'clock in the morning, six months later and think, what did I do? You can say, I had a good process around it. Mm -hmm. I had a good process. So in some ways, I think that's always what I'm trying to give people that come to see me, especially if they're making any kind of decision. I want to make sure you have yeah. a good process. I, I like the idea of giving someone a good process and I'm thinking a little bit about how that can be challenging in adolescence because part of the nature of teenagers is wanting to quickly find the solution and move forward. Um, so I just wanted to, to bring up a couple of, of other things I was thinking about regarding how to find the right therapist for your teenager. I think it's very important not to be um, quickly swayed by somebody's perspective. You know, sometimes parents can find a clinician who shares a similar perspective, let's say, on the fact that maybe dysphoria is a metaphor for something else. Um, but if, if clinicians aren't experienced in adolescence, I think it's easy for adults to forget that teenagers are not just smaller adults. They're, they're so fundamentally different. So I think clinicians who have worked with teens for some time know, or even if it's a parent who has teens, but experience with teenagers is important because the therapeutic process looks a little bit different, I imagine, than how it might with like a 30-year-old or maybe in Debbie's case. I think Debbie was older when she transitioned. Mm. So I think there's a, a different uh, kind of level of uh, patients that teenagers have, of course, and maybe different ways that we connect with them. And along the same vein, clinicians who are not aware of the way social media use has impacted teens will need to do some research in that area. Because also, you know, as adults, we use social media a certain way. I mean, I know I feel addicted to it sometimes, but I didn't grow up experiencing my adolescence on it. And so I think um, clinicians really do need to spend some time trying to understand and get in the mind of teenagers today. And what is it like to play out this developmental process online? Because it's really different, I think, than, than what it's like in 3D. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. point. So, uh, one other thing that we had talked about discussing was that 
uh, parents who have a rapid onset teenager are often in a lot of distress themselves. And there's so much energy in the family going towards how to help their child that oftentimes parents have really not taken the time to process their own emotions mm. or take care of their own needs. So let's discuss that a little bit. I, uh, I, I bring that up with parents and I find it's very, very interesting because this is a big thing with me. And I find they're like, yeah, 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 I'm cracking up, but actually I don't have time to deal with me. <laughs> So could you just sort out the teenager? Let's talk about the teenager. I can't even think about me. I'm completely insane, but I can't think about that. And you know, honestly, it's back to the, you know, the old idea of you put on your oxygen mask before you tend to your child in the airplane. That if you are insane, and they're self-proclaimed saying, oh, sure, I am insane, but I, I have to get help from my teenager because I'm in feeling like this. And as one per person said to me, like, it's like a movie and there's a ticking, there's a clock at the bottom of the screen here. And by God, I can't talk about my problems and my problems with my marriage, and where we came and how the screen uses it. And they talk very fast and I'm talking fast describing it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, and now we have to have holding space therapy and I have to re recommend that you slow down and hold space with that ticking in your screen, kind of on their eyeballs. And it, it makes it so heightened. And yet it's the only way through is that you start thinking, if I want to help my teenager, I have to look towards myself. I have to. But it's really, it's really difficult. So, you know, I hear so many people from so many different places criticize the ROGD parents. And it just seems like they're such an easy group to dump on. Like everyone criticizes them. And I feel just a ton of empathy for these parents because I think that um, whatever issues these families may or may not have had before their child identified as trans, the truth is that having something frightening happen to your child and to receive no help anywhere and anyone that you go that you try to talk to about this to even just get a little emotional support it's like invasion of the body snatchers, you know? It's like you, you think you found a person that is, hasn't been snatched yet by the aliens and you tap them on the shoulder and they turn around and they've got this, you know, <sighs> creepy grin on their face, you know? So, you know, you, you've just had your child tell you that, you know, that they're trans and that they're going to transition and you could be feeling all kinds of things, you know, including maybe maybe you are even you know, proud of them or whatever, but let's say that you're also worried. And then when you speak it, what you get is just, and I've seen this on Facebook, one comment right after another, after another, oh, congratulations. It's so exciting that they found them, their true self or whatever. There's no room. There's no room to say, and I'm worried about the medical interventions. Mm -hmm. There's no room to say, I'm sad, I'm scared, I'm angry. And if you go to a professional, the professional is going to tell you that there's something wrong with you. So these are parents that have been profoundly, profoundly isolated. And that experience makes you crazy. If you weren't crazy to begin yeah. with, you will be made crazy by this experience. I really believe that. So I, I think that... You know, there is such, there can be such a high degree of distress in some of these parents that I can see other clinicians go, whoa, what's up with that woman? But I'm like, but don't you get it? Don't you get how someone gets like that? That being said, the, the point that you're making about really t tending to yourself, something that happens in a lot of these families is, or at least in the families that I've worked with, I mean, it's not that these families don't care about these kids. These, these families care about these kids so much that often what we're looking at is a kind of enmeshment dynamic. And by the way, I have decided, I mean, I have a teen daughter and I've decided that being enmeshed with your teen daughter is normal. <laughs> It oh, might good. be something. <laughs> <It> might, <laughs> you're next. I, I'm not saying it's good. It's something we ought to all work on, but it's just incredibly hard. If you if you're at all connected with your if you're a woman and you're at all connected with your teen daughter, it's very hard not to be like this. <laughs> <laughs> so you so know, it's the, ab you to, abnormally normal. Right, it's abnormally normal. So so again, I'm not wanting to over pathologize it, but I do think that 
some of these parents are just s sort of over identified with the kids. The trans identification is often, as I see it, an attempt on the part of the kid to separate from the parent yeah. a little bit. And unfortunately, what it often does is actually makes mom more like intensely attached to the kids out of fear and anxiety, which is just a bad combination. So it's paradoxical, but one of the important things that parents can do is to create some room to separate to kind of water your own garden so that you have a little bit of emotional space that has nothing to do with the kid, that more than anything may actually help the kid process what's going on with her in a constructive way. Very often the kid wants to separate and find themselves and become themselves and they're afraid to, and it's self-transformation, but they want to become and it's it's such a it's such a, a straight road to become become a different person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. So Lisa, from that framework, I mean, it's it's very important for parents to tend to themselves, not only so that they aren't going crazy, but also so that they can be in the appropriate relationship with their child that might ultimately help their child figure out what the best path forward is. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's very frightening for therapists, or for, for parents, because I remember one parent saying, you know, she, she brought her child to a therapist and the child, the therapist she feels really, really did not um, provide good therapy for the child. And she felt it was like, you know, in the movie when the monster turns out to have been the good guy all along, but he mm. takes off his mask and he's the, the monster. It's, it's such a frightening feeling of, I brought them to the professionals and the professionals didn't look after my child. It's probably the most helpless, frightening situation you could be in. And so I think an awful lot of time has to be given to, to, to that trauma. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, this, this is maybe a, a, an interesting time to bring up, like how to talk with potential therapists. I mean, I think we have thoroughly lifted up some cautionary tales about rushing your child into therapy. Um, but we had discussed before this conversation some kind of good questions that if a parent has a potential therapist in mind, I'm going to read through some of them. And if we want to elaborate on these, we can. So some questions might be um, when you interview the clinician, uh, you could ask what kind of training they've had, um, what kind of postgraduate training they've had, whether they've had any training on gender and gender identity, because that might give us an indication of where they are. Um, maybe ideologically. You can, of course, ask about their license. Having a licensed clinician is important. Um, and if they've ever worked with dysphoric teens before, and then you could ask them to share with you what are their impressions? What do they know? Because this lifts up this question we've discussed before about, you know, is this kid going to be seen as this lone unicorn? Or do they realize that there are kids with the exact same script mm. that come in over and over? Um, you might ask them if they are aware of the term rapid onset gender dysphoria and what they think about it. And I think these open-ended questions are good because that gives the therapist the opportunity to speak in an open-ended manner about what their perspective is. Um, and then there was another question. Do you believe that medical intervention could ever be the appropriate treatment for someone under 25? So we hear this number 25 um, discussed often when it comes to permanent decisions. Do we want to share anything else about that age and why a clinician might be hesitant to prescribe uh, intervention before then? Well, of course, at this point, it's legal to do it before then. In some cases, in some states, it's legal to do it before 18, even without parental consent. But... Uh, you know, I think it is controversial to do it before them because we know that the brain has not finished developing until around that age. The prefrontal cortex, which, help, which helps you take a measure of risk and kind of think about long-term consequences. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, asking a therapist to engage that question, I don't know that there's a right or a wrong answer but how the person thinks through that would be an interesting thing to hear. Mm -hmm. And I guess I would just be listening for an awareness that the young adult brain is still developing 
that these interventions are serious and come with a potential for regret and uh, just um, an orientation towards kind of common sense caution. Mm -hmm. I'm also thinking about an awareness of detransitioners. Yeah. It, it's not lost on me that it seems a lot of people detransition in their early mid 20s. So uh, I think if a clinician is aware of those stories and has listened to them, they may have on their radar the possibility that transition isn't necessarily a panacea for everybody. Yeah, that's a good point. We should we should add that to the list. Are mm -hmm. you aware of of detransitioners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think as well, a certain awareness of the period between 18 and 25 needs to be highlighted. Because I, I find up until 18, maybe it's because I'm in Ireland, but that there's a certain, there's a, there's a, there's parental input. And then, you know, a lot of, lot of people who work in the field have talked about these people who, once they hit 18, they feel I've been waiting and go, 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 let yeah. me go. And there's, it's, it's like, sadly, I've heard that, you know, people working in the in gender clinics say, you know, the children coming from the child clinics really aren't in good shape because they've been basically held till they're 18. They've been held back. And so that they hit the gender adult service with a, I know what to say, I know what I want, give me. And it's like real therapy didn't take place. They just held them, they held them until 18. And so the concept of the kind of the emerging adult and the incredibly strange place of the 18 to 25 year old, where very often these people feel very connected with the parents. They feel the parents should be paying for a lot of things that they feel their parents have a lot of control over them. And yet at the very same time, they're balancing that with I'm an adult now and I can do what I want. And I don't think we've explored this in society. Like, you know, we discovered teenagers, I don't know how many years ago, 100 years ago, and it was a revelation. Well, I think we need to discover 18 to 25 year old, not only in terms of gender, but in general, this whole mm -hmm. weird scenario with 18 and 25, where they think your money is their money but also they have all the power of an adult. <laughs> and it's, it's a really funny, weird position because an awful, lot of ad, an awful lot of parents are paying for their children who are 18 to 25 because they're paying through college. Mm -hmm. And so then power is happening, purse strings, mm. financial control. There's so many issues around this really strange period. It doesn't even have a name. The emerging adult is what it has, but nobody's given enough time that period and I think it's probably, for me, in my therapy, maybe that's who I'm attracting, but it's the one that's coming up the most, 18 mm -hmm. to 25. Where do I go? How do I navigate? And there is some evidence to show that at this period in time, these 18 to 25-year-olds are actually acting like younger teens. Yeah, they are. So I find there's a lot of interesting uh, it, stuff to explore there because they don't even act like the 18 to 25-year-olds of a few decades ago no, yeah well, and the, the, the finances around that so they might be driven to the therapy they come in to me the parents are paying the therapy the parents are paying for their schooling the parents are paying for their transport and they're telling me the parents are withholding money for medical treatment and it's like this is uh, mine this is not none of this is appropriate mm -hmm. all of this is is all of this is messy Mm -hmm. And there isn't really guidelines around it. I don't think there's really kind of accepted practices really here around this. No. We'll definitely talk about this some more because it's interesting and important. Um, I think in the last few minutes here, we're rounding out almost two hours of conversation. Time yeah. flies when we were talking. Um, but we had <laughs> <Almost> some, <laughs> some, <laughs> we had some uh, ideas of, what where parents can go let's say to search for an appropriate clinician for their teen so a couple of uh, ideas we had were just talking to other rogd parents so i know parents of rogd kids is a website run by parents that can connect families with local support groups and other parents in their area so that is one uh, place they can look. There's the Gender Critical Resource Forum where you can post questions and talk to other parents. So that's a, a place to look as well. Um, there's Bayswater and there's Our Duty in, in the UK. 
They okay. both provide, they provide support for parents. Okay. Um, I think it's really, I think it's phenomenal how much, as we said, these the parents are very committed. It's ha- how much information they have and they are very, very generous in sharing it. And it does seem such an un, un, unrecognized or certainly under-researched phenomenon that mm-hmm. the more you can speak with other parents, the better. Just like any new kind of um, condition that came out, the, the parents who, who've experienced it have a wealth of knowledge. And it, it does need to be kind of, I think it's, you can really benefit from accessing it. Mm-hmm. Um, We can definitely list some of these websites below the video. And of course, Fourth Wave Now is is a major resource for parents full of valuable articles and information. Um, And then a couple of other tips that we thought about were therapists who have had some sort of psychoanalytic psychoanalytic training. Um, They may be better equipped, but like we said earlier, it's not necessarily true that they will be free from ideology. So doing those interviews is very important. Um, And then sometimes older therapists who've been in practice for a while, which I think we lifted up as well. Anything else from our list that I might be forgetting? I think that covers it. A a willingness, I think, I think it does cover it, a willingness to um, maybe uh, find out more or read certain pieces that you would like them to read. Mm -hmm shows uh, an openness to the process mm-hmm. that could be mm-hmm. yeah that's a good indicative point. really well do we feel like this is a good place to leave it so. <laughs> thank you so thank much you. sasha thank you yeah. both we'll talk again soon okay no doubt okay. bye mm-hmm.